People and Power. I'm Shireen al -Feki. In today's program, Swept Away. Two years after the Asian tsunami, we look at the power and the problems of foreign aid in Aceh, Indonesia. December 26 marks the anniversary of the tsunami which crashed into Asian and African coastlines, killing more than 230,000 people and leaving an estimated 1.7 million people homeless. Now, the disaster was followed by a flood of foreign assistance, almost $14 billion in pledges. But just how much of this money has been delivered to those who need it, and how well has it been spent? In this special report, People in Power's Juliana Rufus traveled to Aceh to assess progress in rebuilding this battered region. On the 26th of December 2004, a giant tsunami struck the shores of Asia. The epicenter of the earthquake which caused it was near Aceh in Indonesia, making it the hardest hit region. 170,000 people perished, half a million were displaced. What followed was the biggest relief effort in recorded history. An estimated 7.1 billion US dollars was collected from governments, NGOs and private donations for Aceh alone. I had been in the region soon after the tsunami had hit. With the second anniversary of the disaster approaching, there had been news of failed projects and corruption. I was keen to see for myself how the money had been spent so far. Your Fazan met me at the airport. We had worked together the previous year. What's changed over the last year? Well, there is some change, but I believe the progress is very, very slow. And some people suspecting there is a lot of corruption. Are there still people who haven't got any houses at all? Yeah. And there were some demonstrations as well, yeah? Yeah. What happened there? I don't know who started it, but somebody just threw a stone and then everything just became crazy. So there was violence? Oh yeah. A few days earlier, crowds of angry protesters had taken to the streets of Aceh's capital, Banda Aceh. Men, women and children gathered outside the government authority responsible for post-tsunami reconstruction, the BRR, for two days and nights. The demonstrators were angry. They felt they had seen little or none of the money which the international community had given to Aceh, to them, the victims. The demonstration had been organized by a grassroots organization called FORAC. Now their office was deserted and their leader, Panji, had disappeared. So this is the office where you saw them? Yes, this is for our office. Oh, it used to be for our office. I met Panji here and hundreds of other people here. They were gathering and sleeping in this place. Was it really busy? It was really busy, yeah. Amazing. Have we got any phone numbers? You all said no one was answering their phones. The BRR and the Achenese authorities had come down heavy on the organizers and they'd fled. Until we'd get to meet them, I wanted to see why people were so angry for myself. The majority of Achenese live along the coast and fishermen were the most affected by the tsunami. Many died, many others lost their boats and income. Panglima Laud is the union of fishermen and Pak Adli is the chairman. In our community, Aceh, we have two kinds of community. Firstly, fisher community, second, the farming community. But that means in terms of the aid provision here in Aceh that restoring the livelihood of fishermen yeah. is possibly the single most important livelihood program that can be set up. Right, right, right. But Pak Adli told me there were problems with the new boats the fishermen had received. So only six can, uh, from 22, six uh, uh, can be used. So About 22 plan, boats were delivered and yeah. only six are usable. Uh, usable. And who delivered these boats? Which uh, organization? BRR. The BRR. Uh, BRR. Why are the other um, boats not usable? Uh, sank. They sank? Yeah. <laughs> where the operation in the sea? Sank. <laughs> and what was the reason for them sinking? Quality of food. No, good quality of food. Because for the boat itself, in fact, we use special wood. But it was not just the boats provided by the government authority, the BRR, which proved unseaworthy. 
it seemed the international organizations who had poured into Aceh to help were also getting it wrong. Graham North is a British volunteer who's been working in Aceh's coastal communities. He took us to hear the complaints of the fishermen he knew. Originally he had a bow like that, so he lost that in the tsunami. He asked an NGO to replace it and they gave him this one. Which, which is about half the size, yeah. yeah. Lepas, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so when he put the boat in the water, because the wood was not suitable for the sea, the, the wood opened up as it, you know, sp like a sponge, it opened up and the boat just sank. All the boats that you see that are on land and not in the water, they cannot use, they're not suitable, they all leak, the wood's no good. Oh, yeah, you see, it's just... It's just rotting. Wow. So they give them the engine, they give them the boat, but they don't give it as a complete unit. So it's down to the village to put it together. And often they don't, they don't have the tools to do that. They don't give them the tools yet. Quite a few of the international organizations had gotten it wrong. So what's the problem with this boat? Had they been in water or not? Yeah, they were put in the water to be brought to here. And that's when they started sinking. Okay, they were taking on a water journey yeah, to come here, and that's yeah, when they started yeah, sinking yeah. before any fishermen ever yeah. used them. So a boat like this, how much would it have cost the NGO to, to make and bring it here? 12 million rupiah, about $1,200. And how many bad boats in this area alone were delivered? Uh, 50. 50? So we're talking well over 50,000 US dollars wasted on bad boats. They asked for a boat, a good quality one. They gave one that was no good, so the people burnt it straight away. That says it all, really, doesn't it? But it wasn't just the new fishing boats which had come under criticism. There were problems with the new houses provided by the British NGO Save the Children in Pantai Raja in Pidi. These houses may look nice, but the wood used in the construction was untreated and they are infested by termites. Pak Ismail and his family of four lived in one of them. What about the quality of the wood? Is it okay? The wood is poor quality. They used any wood they found. I fixed things myself. Other tsunami victims had refused to occupy the houses. So if everybody else refused, why did you actually move in? I couldn't stand living in a tent any longer. It was hot, stuffy, the children were getting sick, so I decided to go home. If I have to move, so be it. Because of mistakes like this and the general slowness of the reconstruction programs, around 70,000 tsunami victims are still living in barracks and it was the barrack dwellers who had been demonstrating outside the Reconstruction Authority, the BRR. We had finally managed to track down one of their organizers, Pak Yusuf, who took us to meet some of the protesters. Here in Sibri, on the outskirts of Banda Aceh, 1,200 people have spent their last 21 months living cramped into 12 long houses built as temporary shelters. Is that what the sanitary conditions are like? Oh, these are the toilets? And there's it's the sewage that's coming out. And you can smell it too. So basically hygiene is a complete co catastrophe in this place. But even their existence here was not secure. In three months time, people will have to move from here, even though they have nowhere to go. What NGOs are here to help? Only the World Food Program. So only the World Food Program. There are no other NGOs, no Oxfam, no UN, no Muslim aid, Islamic relief, no. Why not? I don't know. Five billion dollars had already been allocated to rebuild Aceh. But the people here in the barracks felt abandoned. After the tsunami, it was, it was the most money that has ever been available after a disaster. 
Where do you think, you haven't seen the money, but where do you think has all this money gone? The elders told me they had no idea. But because they had lost faith in the government and international agencies, they had come to support Forak. They presented papers showing that Forak had asked for an incredible 600 million US dollars to be paid into their account to provide social services for the barrack dwellers. The government authorities questioned Forak's integrity, but the people in the barracks were prepared to follow anybody who could offer them a glimmer of hope.